Right, the Mountain Bike Podcast, episode number one. This is brand new to GMBN, uh, something we're going to be doing uh, a lot of Mondays after the big races of the year. So it's going to be a casual chat with the experts of mountain biking about those biggest and best races on the planet and more. And this kicks off with the very first World Cup downhill race of the year. How is it going to be different to the Dirt Shell? Well, it's going to be a raw show, also to be released as a podcast on your favourite podcast provider. So you can listen at your leisure as well as find them on the GMBN YouTube. Expect the show the Monday after every big race of the year, World Cup Downhill, World Cup Cross Country and the Enduro World Series. We'll be getting the opinions of the experts, co-hosts in the studio, interviews with the pros and arguments with the hosts over their favourite riders. Expect everyone here at GMBN to be involved. I'm hosting the first show as an ex-World Cup Downhill racer. I'm stoked to be doing it. Uh, when it comes to World Cup Cross Country, we'll be asking the professionals uh, to give their insights from those ex-pro cross country racers. So it's going to be available on Spotify, Google, uh, and iTunes eventually. That will take a few days. And today I'm uh, joined in the studio by a co-host, Steve Jones. So you're an expert on World Cup Downhill. You wrote a book about it, 25 years of World Cup Downhill. A journalist of many years, an Aaron Gwynn fanboy, <laughs> and an EMBM presenter. Yeah, I mean, Don, it's what we wait for, right? It's uh, World Cup downhill. It's so compelling. It's, you know, all these riders, they walk in a tightrope. Yeah. And, you know, it's pretty much a bit in between, like, free climbing and climbing ropes. You know, you cannot make any errors. And yeah. and, and so it panned out at Maribor, the first World Cup of 2019. Yeah, like, I, I still get super excited about this. Yeah. I mean, it's been nine, ten years, I think, since I raced World Cup downhill. But now I'm like... Big fanboy of the races. Can't wait to see it. Happen. Actually, it wasn't Maribor your last World it Cup It was. Race. I didn't want to talk about that, Steve. <laughs> I have some bittersweet memories from Maribor. I've got some brilliant memories from it. I love the place. Love yeah. the track. Especially going back to those old school versions. I raced my first season, 2000. And it was one of those big Alpine, amazing fun tracks to ride. I'd yeah. seen it on the videos. Showed up there. Absolutely loved it. But also, I yeah, my last ever World Cup, I punched in qualifying, yeah. called it a day. That was it. <laughs> oh, dear. But yeah, going back to track, I mean, it is a hell of a track, right? Yeah. It's got, I don't know, it's got, what, 80 to 100 corners. It's got That's roots. It. It's got rocks. Uh, for me, it is, it's, it's, a, it's a perfect downhill, World Cup downhill track. I Many think. of those sections are still the same. That rock garden. Um, even, well, when I, I think the first year I did it, you started from the top of the hill. I remember seeing, do you remember Timo going over the bars and that big, one of the biggest over the bars ever, hitting that big soft jump and going over? Yeah, and a fellow Shropshire colleague of yours, Kate Bircham, broke both wrists off one Did of the she? jumps. Went, Is that right? I don't remember that. But I think, I think one of the biggest crashes of Maribor was Josh Bryceland when he, you know, he I was going to say that. Down to the rock garden. Do you remember him? Super skinny. He was quite, well, I wasn't young, but he was skinny. That big black bell motocross helmet and he he missed the sort of skinny bit of the rocks went off the side yeah and oh, went down crikey. hard but you know what 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 strikes me is every single time you know, you've got world cup downhill racing and you've got a human element and you've got a mechanical element yeah this year you know you look at look at the bikes different wheel sizes different components yeah and then you've got the human element different different rider weights different strategies different line choices and it all comes down to the top five, which was separated by one and a half seconds. Is it that close? Mental. Well, let's get into the bike. So pre-season, there's always a lot of chat. Um, what's this 2019? We're still talking about wheel sizes. Yeah. On 29ers, I made a little list. We've got Gwyn, riding his brand new Intense M29. Yeah. Uh, Pyrion, Connor Fearon, that Kona. The Athertons, of course, brand new bike, 29er. Most of common style, not all of them. Uh, YT, Angel Suarez. Yeah. And Mark Wallace, who went on to qualify fastest. Uh, we had a bit of a WhatsApp group before the race, um, and I said, if Mark Wallace wins this race, I'll eat my hat. <laughs> and I said, I'll eat your car. <laughs> <laughs> Which is no disrespect to Mark Wallace. No. He's obviously got speed. Uh, Absolutely. But um, it, things were shaken up a little bit in qualities with the rain. Yeah. Uh, but it was a good ride from him. But going, going back to the, you know, we're talking wheel size here, right? And it's, it's now probably a decade since Jeff Stever, owner of Intense. Yeah made a 29 inch wheel downhill bike and it's no one raced it for a long long time they didn't i mean obviously component trees such as tires and forks yeah. and things like that were, were difficult but it's it's taken it's only in the last two years that we've seen 29 inch wheel downhill bikes yeah come on the on the world cup circuit you know it's, the syndicate did it at lords 
uh, two years ago, they turned up with a whole fleet of 29 everyone, bikes. There was a massive kerfuffle. Oh, should they be doing this? Should they not be doing went, that? Uh, running around after that race, trying to make their own <laughs> or bodge their own Exactly. Exactly. And you know what? I remember Danny Hart turned up before William with a 29 inch wheel bike. You know, it was bodged together last minute and he didn't get on with it. The thing with 29 inch wheels, it takes a long time to adapt and change your timing to ride a 29 inch wheel bike, right? So, well, yeah, for me, I think I'm just on that cusp of being tall enough to be able to ride it, although I've not ridden a 29 a downhill bike. Yeah. We've seen the mixed wheel bikes, of course, Danny Hart. The mullets, as they call them. I'm not sure I like the, the mullet <laughs> bikes name for it, but Danny Hart running a small wheel on the back. We saw G. Atherton, actually, was it a couple of years ago at yeah. uh, Fort William British National, get bucked over the bars because he stuck his ass in the back wheel. Yeah. And he, that takes a bit of getting used to. So it does. for well, for shorter rides, it's going to be harder. Mm. Um, the new Specialized, running a big wheel up front. So Bruni yeah. and Finn Isles, uh, McKenna, Windmasters, and yeah. Fayol also running those mixed wheel bikes. Yeah. It's funny. It's become, obviously, the UCI have allowed it this year yeah. as well, which is yeah. a really important point. Um, Interesting to see UCI moving their rules yeah. around. They're not something we're used to. But, but you know what? You see, you know, we're talking the mixed wheel size, 29 front, 27.5 rear. You've got a lot of e-bikes at the moment, the likes of Canyon, yeah. oh, Ghost, I knew Fantec. Well, I have to because, <laughs> because, you know, because they've actually led the way with the mixed wheel size yeah. pretty much. So. No, I actually do agree on that. Um, not many people run in the smaller wheels still. 27.5, should we say. Smaller wheels, not 26 no. more. But they Tro ain't dead. Troy Brosnan. Yeah. Adam Brayton. Yeah. I can't think who else, to be fair. <laughs> Are you Remy Tyrion. Jack's, Jack's in the mix now. Yeah, Jack's in uh, Jack. <laughs> Tyrion, I, one of my favourite riders, actually, Remy Tyrion. Totally. You know, he won Val Nord back in... Yeah. When did he win Val Nord? He oh, won, won a, he's won one, one World Cup. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, when you talk about, you know, Lug Bruni's now won three World Cup races, right? And three World Champs. And three World Champs. Uh, Danny Hart has won three World Cup races. Amory Piron won three World Cup races last year. Yeah. So they're all, all now on, on three in the trot. But uh, it's almost coming back to what World Cup racing was back in the in the 1990s, the, the French, the British, and the yeah. Americans. I mean, Charlie, you know, there's like now three, I think there's three Americans in the top 10. Yeah, that's that, like happened overnight, right? And that's, it's been a while since that's happened. Oh, totally. Um, as far as French go, I think it's like definitely new school compared to you know the Nicos and your yeah. who are Pascal, I suppose, would be one of the old school Frenchmen. Yeah, and Cedric Gracia. Yeah, but oh, you know what's funny is that you know we're looking at the likes of Piron Hart and, and Bruni as as you know the current superstars, which they are. But yeah. when you put it in in the historic context, yeah. you know they still don't even break in the top ten of the most World Cup wins ever. No. So um, I think we're expecting a lot of these guys. Maybe we've been maybe a little too quickly. Possibly. Did you see the video with Bruni interviewing Pirion? No. Uh, and they were talking about um, not mentioning any names here, but they were talking about uh, who inspired Pirion, uh, and I'm presuming it was old Frenchman. And he was saying that yeah. when he got to know them, they weren't as nice as he had hoped they were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not naming any names here. What, the, what, the old French racers? Well, possibly, yes. I mean, they, they, when it comes to focus, uh, you know, you, you look at the likes of Vulias and, and Burrell. Yeah. Focus like uh, like no other, really. And yeah. I, they probably learned a lot of things from those guys, you know, undoubtedly. Yeah. Uh, right, so did you have any favourites coming into the season? Of course, Anne Gwynsey, man. <laughs> I, do, I don't know where this comes from. <laughs> I, I, you know, you've got to... You've got to you got to respect someone who's raced oh, who's respect, raced yeah. 69 World Cups yeah. and he's won 20 of them. You have got the stats, Steve Jones. You've got, <laughs> where have you brought your blue book with you today? I have brought the blue book. I mean, but let's not get into that. <laughs> and, you know, you, you look, you know, look, it takes a long time to win World Cups and it took Gwyn a, a while to work it out. Yeah. And you, 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 you might take the mick that I'm a, a Gwyn <laughs> fan. I am a Gwyn fan because... I'm I'm a fan of anyone who can win a World Cup race because yeah. it takes a special skill to be able to apply yourself and deliver that that run under pressure. And, yeah, of course. And um, and yeah, he, he he worked it out. And I got to respect the guy who can do that. Totally. Um, coming into it, actually, I was really impressed with Matt Simmons. Uh, he's a uh, he's from my uh, town of birth. Matt Simmons or Matt Walker? Uh, Matt Walker, sorry, okay. <laughs> Matt Simmons. I was just talking about the You're thinking about the Candale. No, yeah. Matt Walker. Sorry, that's another talking point. Is, yes. is, is uh, Matt Simmons and the new Cannondale bike? When it, I mean, we're talking tech and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, we will do. Um, but Matt Walker, he's really built up over the years. I think. Yeah, uh, was, it, was he junior last year? But it was been we're doing for really last. Well. I mean, basically, Finn Isles and Matt Walker. Yeah, they, they raced together. But you know what? One more, a lot with a lot more hype than the other, I think. One with a lot more hype. So I think Finn Isles, obviously on the big team, specialised. Well, 
you say hype. I mean, Finn Isles in his last year juniors won every single race bar one. Mm. There's hype, That's and, they, and there's big. and there's there's facts on the ground, right? So there was a there was an IXS race at Maribor the week before the World Cup, and Matt Walker beat. Danny Hart yeah. and quite a few other notable races there so he's definitely up to speed early in the year yeah I'd be interested to see what happens there that's an interesting point actually Don if you think that you know Danny Hart and Matt Walker that's a really really strong team really two good mechanics behind them as well wow and then you've got what do you mean well I was gonna, <laughs> my next point would be they're, they're managed by Will Longdon my ex-team manager <laughs> I'm thinking he must be starting to get worried because at the end of the year if it's going like this they yeah. won't be able to afford those two guys I right. don't think right should we talk money, should we? <laughs> <laughs> but you go on to... Uh, but what I was going to say, it was a really strong team, Danny Hart and, and uh, Matt Walker. And then obviously you've got uh, Loic Bruni and Finn Isles. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's a great specialised team as well. So it must be... Very strong. They probably help each other. I, I don't know, what, what's the dynamic going to be like in a, in a team? I mean, you've been on uh, many World Cup teams. I have. It? I mean, I've always found it pretty difficult when, especially if you have an insight as to how much your teammate might be getting paid. <laughs> and then if you beat them, you would feel like you're getting underpaid. So you're, there's definitely competition. Is Well, first thing, first rule of racing is beat your teammate. So... It's a difficult one, especially when I'm thinking of Saracen. I don't know how much they're getting paid, but I would imagine Danny Hart's getting paid a lot more than Matt Walker. Yeah, but Saracen have done well, though. They've they, yeah, they, they built that brand up in the yeah. last decade. And they've supported Matt Walker a lot over the years, actually. Yeah. So. Yeah. What about the ladies? It looks to me like coming into the season, I've always, I would always have said it's going to be a two-horse race between Rach and Tarney. Bit of that sort of question you on no one knew the answer to is how good is the Athlon bike gonna be for yeah, Rach? Yeah. And it's hard to win there. If Rach doesn't win the race, then everyone's gonna say, Oh, it's the bike. If Rach does win the race, then everyone's saying, mm. Oh, it's Rach. She always wins races. Yeah, I mean it's very it's very um it's very bold of them to to make their own bike company, the Athens. Yeah. But then I'm thinking, is it a distraction? You know, when you've got the likes of Trek or Specialized behind you, when you that's that's one thing and it takes a huge team to develop a bike and, and, and manage things. So I'm wondering if... Yeah. It, is, is it a distraction? I don't know. It's... Well, who's done it in the past? Nico's done it. Nico, Nico's done it. Literally, yeah. from the ground up, made their own bike. There aren't many, I think, high-class World Cup races that have done it. No, and he was incredibly successful on it as he well. He didn't ride it for very long, though, did he? Three years. Oh, was it? Yeah, Look three years on the V process. Right. I mean, you know, he won World Cup Series. He won World Championships on that bike. I mean, Don, come on. You cannot forget 2002 when he hadn't, he hadn't raced all year and he turns up from the last oh, race World of the year, Champs. the World Championships, and Pete and everyone was there to win the race. Willis comes down. Boom. Where was that? Caprun. Caprun, that was, yeah. Well... He was a one-off, I think, to be fair. But um, going back to the women's racing, uh, yeah, I think Tani, I mean, last year, Rachel won, uh, did she win three of the seven last year? Mm, I, don't um, know, I think, uh, yeah, she won three of the seven races last year. Yeah, it was fairly tight in the overall. The year before, um, 2017. 2016, sorry, she right. won. She won everything in 2016. Yeah, right. Actually, okay. that that was on a. She won actually 13 races on the trot. Yeah. I mean, that is mental. But I sense a little bit that Tani has actually made inroads into. Her, I think. I think. I think Tani looks in real good shape this year. Yeah. She's riding really well. Uh, Qualies went down. Tracy Hannah actually was fastest. Um, it was Rach then Tani, but yeah. I think Qualies at the first race of the year is. It's a nervous time for a lot of the riders, so I think it's always going to be reflective of the actual result. Hmm. We saw it in men's, obviously Wallace first, yeah. Gwyn second, Finn yeah. Isles third. Green I think Gwyn was confident region. after that after that qualifier, but then uh, I'd say Gwyn was confident, and Bruni didn't. At least he didn't come across as being very confident. Yeah. Bruni on camera. And, um, did, uh, we're talking about bikes though. Gwyn had two identical bikes at the race, uh, a large and an XL, and right. he was chopping between them, not deciding on which one he wanted to race on. Right. It, from my point of view, that can't help, surely. It can't help. I mean, that. I mean that. Wow, that brings me back to 2013. So Gwyn had obviously been the the most brilliant World Cup racer ever for for two years, 2011, 2012, when he worked around the track. Then there's there was the departure to Specialized, and uh, when he went to Specialized, he he actually went to a I think he went to a, a meet. A, a medium or a large size bike. Obviously, what he hadn't done was test mm. different size specialized demos over the winter. He turns up first World Cup of the year and he went, he, I think he's down in 27th place or something like that. He wow. goes to Val de Sol, yeah. uh, second race of the year. He swaps, he swaps bike sizes. He actually happened to be, I happened to be at that race because it was where 
uh, Olin's launched the f- launched their uh, shock, and yeah. uh, he actually took my size XL off me. I was Did trying he? out at the time, <laughs> uh, and he came back. And I think he was. You think he was like top top ten that weekend. But yeah, you, you can't. You can't really be messing around with bike I sizes mean, on race weekends. It's under, been underprepared, surely. If, you, if you're showing up to a race with two bikes, I, I don't know, but I'm not Aaron Gwynn, but to me, that is not being prepared for a race. I, I'd, probably, I'd probably agree with you there, Don. Um, uh, but I'm not, you know, we're not Aaron Gwynn. No. He obviously knows what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, there's a couple of shocks in qualies. So Minar did not qualify for his first World Cup race in 20 That's years, shame, which I it? find that hard to believe. It's Honestly, it's... Uh, I mean, that guy, I mean, he's 38. Yeah. I mean... So well, he's the same age as me, and I, he started racing World Cups for I did. I can't believe he's still there. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. Still at the top, pretty much. Yeah. And he, um, so he broke his arm last year, didn't he? So he missed yeah. a load of races, so unprotected. So those top riders from last year are protected, so if anything goes wrong... They still make it to the final, which yeah. is it makes such a difference. I mean, you could almost argue to make an exception for someone like Greg Minard, couldn't you? I, I, I you can't know. obviously. Yeah, but, uh, racing's I racing. I think it's a, it's a real shame that, that you know one of the icons of the sport couldn't yeah. race, and I'm sure he would have. You know, I'm sure he's he's still a podium p- possibility. Don, do you think? Yeah, I think so. Um, there's definitely a new guard appearing in well, World Cup. Down I or? want to pick up on that. <laughs> so I want to pick up on that, right? Everyone, everyone talks about this new generation, well, right? Yeah. Well, they do. Everyone talks about the new generation. It took. Uh, you look at you look at Bruni, Piron, and Hart, right? Um, they are uh, 25, 28, and twenty four respectively, right? Right. Okay. It took it took Bruni six years, six years to win a World Cup race. It took Danny Hart eight years to win a World Cup race. Yeah. And it took Piron. Piron's now in his fifth year, and it took you know it took him four years to to get in there. And uh, I, I'm not sure. You know, I think we talk we expect too much of this of this of this new generation. But they are bumping down some of these guys, like Minar and G. Should we say? It, possibly. I mean, I don't know. Uh, anyway. Danny Hart was lucky to be protected in qualifying because he did not have a good qualifier. I forget where he was, but it was way out of there. Wynn did not qualify, not protected. Yeah. So it was a bit of a shake up there. Yeah. Um, but but going back going back to this new generation, right? Um, <laughs> uh, what, what I'm going to say is like like I said, Hart, Hart, Piron, and and Bruni, you know, they're 20, 26, 28. Um, Greg Minar, who is who a lot of people talk about as the greatest downhill race of all time, even though maybe. Nico Vulio's uh, won more World Championships and more World Cup Series. How old did, was Nico when he retired? This twenty. Me. I think he was twenty-five. That's right? ridiculous. Okay, so here, here's the thing, right? When we're going back to this new generation, Greg Minar uh, had only won four World Cups by the time he was twenty-seven, right? And he went on to become, you know, this, you know, one of the greatest yeah, ever that's races. Yeah, crazy. So uh, people forget these things. Everyone, everyone thinks, everyone thinks the likes of Matt Walker and Finn Isles, they're going to come in. They're going to win World Cups in their first year. That's that's just not going to happen. You know, they didn't mm. win last year. I, I'd imagine they will podium and possibly win this year. I think Finn has got a win in him this year. Right. And but, he, he has to. You know, when you look, when you look historically, like of you know, Vulio, Sam Hill, you know, they were winning World Cup races in the first two well, years. Back in my day, there was no ju- <laughs> there was no junior World Cup, and a junior was expected, if they're any good, to get in the top twenty, top thirty in the overall World Cup. Mm. Which we talk about actually with the ladies. Valley Hall won all the Junior World Cups last year, yeah. um, and lots of people. She's in her second year this year again in Junior World Cup. So everyone starts talking about how would she go in the women's. I think she'd have been top five, right? No, she would have been eighth. Eighth. So it's not. I mean, it's good, but it, yeah, yeah. It's, in really in the women's, it looks to me like a two horse race this year. Yeah. And I don't tr- know. I think I think Tracy Hannah will be in there. She's there, but what were the times? It was much closer. It was. <laughs> There was 0.85 between uh, Rach and Tani, but then it was back two and a half to Tracy. Right. And then there's a bit more more, more of a jump to Caribou and Harashnik. So it feels like there's a two it's, and one and a two. It's quite good, the, the Slovenian Harash... How do you pronounce Harashnik? Harashnik, I believe. I mean, it's, it's great. A, a local yeah. was in the top top five there, isn't it? Did you see how on the run, so Tani and Rach were like back and forth, green and red, green and red, green and red, and it went down to the line, Tani took it. Yeah. Pretty impressive. Oh, totally. And... Do you think then it's this confidence game, right, Don? And yeah, uh, I think I, I, I see a slight. I feel a slight shift in I the last two years. That, I don't know Tani that well, to be fair. Rachel, I think has you always know Rachel been, quite well. I do. <laughs> Some ancient history there. 
Um, but I think she... 2005, right? Well, something like that, probably. Yeah, I can't remember. But it sort of swings with her. Her confidence is either sky high or it's really low. And I think it's, I find it a bit crazy that she isn't more confident all the time because she can always win a World Cup race. I think if she's in the right state of mind, she will always win it. Well, it has always been that way. Maybe not this year. So it's interesting to see. It's my, what I'm thinking about with, with the whole female, with the, with the women's class, is that uh, Rachel... Um, you know, will she beat Anne Caroline Chosson's record of 41 World Cup wins? I don't think so. I mean, well, she's on, uh, she's actually on 37. Well, that's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, four more wins and she equals, she becomes yeah, arguably the greatest downhill racer ever, right? Yeah, true. I mean, maybe she hasn't won the same World Championships as Anne Caroline, but yeah. I mean, 41 World Cup well, wins. Anne Caro, uh, in her day, was unbeatable, really. Yeah. She was a step ahead of all of them. Yeah. I, yeah, she got beaten by own, only on her worst days, I would have thought. I think, I think Anne Caroline raced 52 World Cups. Yeah. And she won 40, 50, 41. Jack, what are you going to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> Insane. Yeah. I, you know, Rachel's, you know, Rachel's been racing now World Cups for 15 years, Don. Yeah. That's crazy, isn't it? It's a long time. I mean, obviously not the same as Minata, who's been racing 21, 21 World Cup years. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Do you get tired? Do you get tired of it? I think you get... The challenge is, I think, fades a little bit if you've done it so many times. If you've been to Fort William 25 times. <laughs> in fact, I've probably raced 20, Fort William 25 times just yeah. through BDS and World Cup. So, yeah, for me, that the motivation faded slightly. I mean, it's tough enough. I mean, how many years have you been to Fort William for GMBN? Five years? Five, yeah, probably. But it's tough enough being, doing, <laughs> it's, doing it's that role, right? It's much more fun doing it from this side of the tape, to be honest. <laughs> Fort William was a brilliant race, but I actually hated the track. But the actual race was amazing because the crowd just turned it on. Yeah. So actually when you're riding top to bottom, it was fun. But the whole getting up there, practicing, did not enjoy that very much, to be fair. It's a tough old place in Fort William. And it's the next round, actually. Next round, yeah. In a month's time. A month to wait, yeah. What about going back to the men's race? So Matt Walker put in an early run, super fast. Mm. Obviously he won the IXS. Danny Hart put 1.2 into him, which looked pretty strong at the time. Yeah, I, do you know what? I, I think it, it, it's great watching it on TV. You, know? you, yeah. see, you can you can actually see. I think when when Hart came down, it was like, oh, oh, this this is this is happening. That now. looks almost unbeatable. And, and Warner talked about it. The rock section, I think Dan it was, was the fastest. It was insane, wasn't it? Yeah. Wow. I, I, and when you when you walk that rock section, it does not look it like it is. It's, it's it's ridiculous. It's deadly. Do yeah, totally. fall off at there at your own risk. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, I, and I think it comes back to it takes that. That's what it takes to win a World Cup race, and it, you can see it visually on the screen. Um, it, those tires, those tires are pushing the edge, but you can't push them too much. Well, that's what I was going to say. Actually, yeah. so Fearon uh, went straight through the rocks. A different line. So it looked slow. Uh, on the exit to the fire road and he lost a load of time there yeah. so on the easiest part of the whole track it, it, basically if you don't exit that rock section fast you're going to lose a whole load of time yeah. so there's a lot to think about stringing those sections together uh, Brooke McDonald was wild how much would you expect with Brooke McDonald <laughs> <laughs> I uh, think one of our colleagues uh, thought Brooke would win the race actually yeah yeah, yeah. Tom Grundy, yeah, I thought. Uh, I mean, he's always there to win races and the lap, uh, lozenge or however you pronounce it last year, he yeah. qualified fastest and went down like a big bag of nails. Yeah. yeah. I think his teammate, uh, Laurie Greenland, uh, I think yeah. he looked fast as well. Yeah. I think, uh, and like, but what I'm trying to say is, I think Hart looked incredibly fast and, and Bruni looked ridiculously fast. He did. I think Bruni is the best looking rider on a bike. I think he just looks great riding that bike. The bike yeah. fits him, it works. Yeah. But we're talking about bikes. That bike was brand new this year to him. So but look, but look at the. I mean, him and him and his mechanic. They've they've done so much uh, data recording. I was going to say that bike. They are one of the teams that really go into data data acquisition. Yeah, I mean, many of them do. Danny Hart does actually. Yeah, but I, th I think I think you know I think um, Loic and his and his mechanic engineer they are obsessed with it. Yeah. You know they what were they talking about the level of detail and how much of pressure how much pressure they put on their brakes and things like that. Yeah. But surprisingly, I'm 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 shocked that Bruni's actually taken several years to get his head round the 29 inch wheel up front. <laughs> I thought he, yeah, I'd have thought he'd been testing it a lot, lot. Uh, Do you think they would run 29 a rear if they could fit him? Can they fit him on that bike? I'm not sure. Actually. Well, I'm sure they'll make anything fit, won't they? Yeah, I don't know. Um, so I thought it was an uncharacteristic run from G. 
when you saw him hit the fire road, he wasn't stood up sprinting like you see G. He finished 26th. Right. Bit, bit poor by, well, very poor by G standards. So, yeah. Uh, we'll see. Uh, Laurie Greenland was, uh, was interesting. I, talking about styles of, of riding, I, I, he, he seems to have a, a strange upward pedaling style. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, <laughs> but then when you see him, when you see him, when he's freewheeling and coasting down through sections, he he is like I think he is one of the most stylish riders. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it comes it comes back to you know we talked to Martin Ashton earlier. Yeah. About who, what were one was one wheel size better than another, better than another wheel size on the Maribor oh. course. I think it's profit and loss all the way down the hill, right? I think if we actually look at top five, it's a, it is a real split between 29ers and the mixed yeah. wheel bikes and 27.5. I mean, basically, it's down to how, how the rider interprets the terrain going down there. What what parts of the ground they're going to pump? Because that's that's where you get speed. And yeah. On a hill, on a hill like that, you, you're basically not pedaling. And that yeah. that's what's great about it, I think. You, you, know, you want to see World Cup races. You don't want to see them pedaling down But it's hill. not super steep, though. So you are working. Like I say, there's yeah. a lot of pumping going on that race. Yeah, that's, so it's, an, it's a total all-body worker, right, Dan? Yeah. I mean, you've uh, ridden it loads of times. Yeah, time, so. yeah. Uh, I love that place. Um, Perion looked strong, but he did lose little bits pretty much the whole way down his run. Um, Bruni obviously put in that super strong run to take the win. Um, he was up, took it by 0.4, which is a reasonable gap, I suppose. To Danny, um, one of the surprises for me actually was Charlie Harrison riding that track. This is it. This is it. Like I said, you know, these the Americans seem to have arrived overnight. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna go back to that other question we should talk about earlier, which was the the new generation. Well, we've seen eras in World Cup racing, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, if you look, if you look at it, it, was there's always been an era. There's been the Vulios era, there's been the Pete era, there's been the Hill era, the the Minar era, and the and the Gwyn era. And my question is, do you think, do you think we're going to see a new era, and who might it be, or maybe we'll not see a new I era? I don't think we will, personally. I think it's just so. Well, it's always tight. I know everyone yeah. always says, "Oh, so tight this year." It's always yeah. been tight. Yeah. But they have you, you're right. There have been eras. I just think at the moment anyone could win, and there is ten people there. Exactly. Well, so when we're doing our little WhatsApp group to begin with, I was like, "Well, no one can predict because it's so close. You can potentially I think, I be think lucky." I think you'll right find winner. Don. I think you will find that I predicted that Bruni would win. I thought. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> But we were talking top fives, and of course, <laughs> anyone could be there. Um, yeah, I I, and we both predicted that it would be Bruni Hart and and, uh, and Piran would be in that top five. Yeah, and it's first actually year that Danny Hart's had a good opener. Yeah, it's the first year that Gwyn has not won. Well, why well, four of the, four of the last five opening rounds he's won. Yeah, so I think I think Gwyn will be seriously disappointed with that. Did so he, sixth place. That's um, like that's not what. That's not what he was paid to do, right? Well, that's but, what we're talking about. Um, he was quite open about saying that he thought it was worth a million dollars. Sixth place is not worth a million dollars. No, but if, I think if you go back to the when, when he signed for YT, right? I mean, that was a, allegedly a million dollar deal, right? Yeah, well, I think he said, didn't he? Though? And 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 he, you know, he, you know, what is Gwyn worth it? Of course, he's worth it because if you're a team and you want to, you want to endorsement of your product, right? Yeah. Back to you three years ago, Gwyn was the only person you would put money on to win a World Cup race. So what you're, hands down. So what you're saying down. is Gwyn was worth a million. He's not anymore. <laughs> well, I, I bet you, I bet you, he'll he'll have learned a lot from from that race. And as he said so himself on Instagram, actually, that didn't go as he wanted it to, but he's learned a lot. Yeah. And of but, course, it's only the first race of the year. First race of the year, but he's but he's not he's not going to be happy with that at all. And. As are the other riders who maybe didn't perform, like Vergier. Bad, Vergier. bad yeah. weekend for Santa Cruz. Now this this is this is another thing, right? Is it's not good. It's not good to go down crashing, right? You can crash in, become can become a habit, and you don't want to be doing that. Uh, especially <laughs> if we're talking confidence, it's it's a big part of the game. And on the first race of the year, yeah. I mean, I did it back in the day. I, yeah. I, I'd had a good, quite good very first year. And then the second year, I was like, right, hyped up. And I exactly. did not qualify for two or three in a row. But how, do you know, how do you know? How do you know? where? Obviously, is Isles going to be like out to prove something at Fort William? There's a danger Ooh. of pushing too hard. So I was going to, I'm trying to be devil's advocate here, but I was going to say, Finn Isles, was he riding like a junior? Over riding like a junior? You know, we see him hyped up. They want to perform and then boom. So like someone who qualifies first and then crashes. Yeah, I mean you don't you don't 
he crashed in what looked like a fairly easy spot. Who knows? I, yeah, I mean, it was very rooty. Yeah. But, um, yeah, and the same with Virgil as well. Virgil, you know, Virgil has crashed a few times. That was a big one. You see, it was kind of weird. Like, he pedaled hard, and then he cruised along the end of the fire road to try yeah. and save a bit of energy, I suppose. It, yeah. But it almost looked like he, ripped, well, he did misjudge the speed. Took his, eye the game. Took his eye off the game. And slapped the back his back wheel into that tree. Sam Hill crashed there. Oh, did he? That one, yeah, 2010. I didn't I know that. Um, right. I remember that bit being fast and it, the, the ground drops away from you. So lucky to not get hurt in a pretty big a pretty big crash. So what about the rest of Santa Cruz? Lucas Shaw did not race. That's a shame, really. Because like Lucas Shaw, he, you know, last year he qualified first in quite a few World Cups last year. Yeah, three, I think. Yeah, he? yeah he's, he's, a, he's a great kid. And, yeah, uh, yeah, I think he'll... He'd yeah. be another, another one of the Americans. You know, you've got, you know, you got Charlie Harrison, you've got Lucas Shaw, the Americans, and you've got the three French... Yeah. And you got two strong Brits. Like I said, it's back to the nineties, and, and and you, you, I don't think you. I think it's gonna be a really, it's gonna be an interesting year. Actually, it'd be interesting to see if someone does. Obviously, someone's gonna dominate somewhere. Who's it gonna be though? I think Finars will win a race before the end of the year. Right, but we'll see. Jack, can you record that? <laughs> actually, we are recording this. Yes, of course we are. <laughs> yeah. um, what about Gwyn's run then? So he lost a big chunk mid-track and then was consistently slower lost time at every split to Bruni overconfidence he looked I mean Gwyn always looks always looks smooth doesn't he uh, same as Brosnan and yeah wh whereas the likes of Hart and Bruni they always look slightly where those those tyres are pushing a bit too much yeah true well they don't I can't ma remember uh, many Danny Hart crashes I'm probably wrong my memory's not brilliant um, I don't know Gwyn's run uh, it was luck it was still a bloody good run, right? He's still only two seconds off, right? Still what was six. the time? Yeah. What was the time? Yeah, it's 1.6 back. 1.6 seconds. That is... It's nothing, is it? It is. It's tight at the top. But it's not used to be down in six, that's for sure. <laughs> so I, what are your takeaways from this race? I, mine is there's people messing with bikes. Gwyn messing around with a large Nexel. Rach said she did some big changes to her suspension in the morning of the, of the, of the race. I think it's not a great time to be doing those is, things. Is there an argument to say that, that certain bikes are good for certain tracks? Um, I don't know, because if you talk about Gwyn dominating, his bike can't have been good everywhere in those years. So it's the yeah. rider overcomes those things. I mean, I think I think you I think you adapt to a bike and, and your timing is adapted to that. It doesn't take long to adapt to a new bike, but yeah. I think mid-race is probably not the place to be doing that. Are we going to talk about Lope Bruni's trousers? Oh, the trousers. Of course, the clothing. Of course. Oh, Let's talk terrible. clothing. They looked like they were shorts, but they weren't. They were trousers. I want to I I cast your mind back to uh, Maribor 2000 when Petey actually raced it in a full skin suit with no peak. No peak. I, Warner said in the commentary <laughs> that he'd never raced without a peak. I'm sure. I yeah, Warner remember. definitely has I'm raced sure. without a peak. I'm going to have to dig some photographs. <laughs> yeah. But do you know what was really funny? It was like the French Hollers got blasted for being the ones with skin suits and no peak. Yeah, yet in that race, I think Pete was in a skin suit and, a, and no peak, whereas Vulios was actually in baggy clothes and, 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 and a visor. And uh, yeah. And I think Petey beat him. <laughs> but yeah, definitely the tight clothes are, have come back. I mean, Trousers are super tight. I mean, I think the kits look good. Uh, I think so, yeah. So nothing wrong with that. But, uh, you know, Piron apparently is wearing Miriam Nichols trousers yeah apparently did you see Vergier lost his peak in that crash <laughs> never a good look <laughs> running the bullet uh but yeah loads of people are on tight tight kit it's it's um i think what back, the, what it? the roadie says is that anything over 20 kilometers an hour it makes a difference so the average right. speed well the what was the average speed there? i don't know but speed trap was 58? Like 52 or something isn't it? yeah 58 kilometers an hour they're not hanging about are they yeah yeah so it's gonna make a difference aero will make a difference so yeah are we going to see the UCI relax their rules on mullets? Aero on the bike. <laughs> <laughs> They've relaxed the rules on mullets, so maybe yeah. uh, clothing's the next one. Um, I think the wheel size debate is still raging because there is a real mix, uh, especially in the men's. Well, women's, it's 29 as uh, the second place. Tarny rides 27.5. But in the men's, it's a mix of the mixed bikes and 27 and 29. So jury's out on that. Fort William is coming up in a month. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see what's happening with that. I think that'll be, yeah, that'll be the, the turning point, wouldn't it, really? Yeah, I can't wait for the rest of the season now. It definitely whet my appetite for more World Cup races. Yeah, I love it. love every single minute of it. 
and uh, I think it's exactly good watching it on on TV, right? Yeah, uh, the coverage is, is better than ever. Yeah, you know, I think so. the coverage was really good actually. On the Being weekend, able to watch it live is amazing. Yeah. So I think that's time to wrap up the podcast. The next podcast will be in a couple of weeks. We've got the Injury World Series in Madeira. And then shortly after that, I think it's Albstadt for the first World Cup cross country. So we'll be getting some experts in the studio to chat about those. But yeah, thanks for joining us for the first ever Mountain Bike Podcast. Uh, find it on Spotify, on Google and on iTunes soon. And of course, on our YouTube channel.